it's kind of blinking power. Yeah, just press it. Oh, what, what are we doing? Turn this on. I press the B. Hit twice. There we go. OK. Um, we are up and going. Now, do you have another uh, recitation you wanted to do? Uh, no. OK. <laughs> but you have a couple. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, well, they're, they're, they're kind of right connected. Uh -huh. I might have something to write in an essay when I get home. I believe. That's okay. right there. See, uh, we have all kinds of things to do today. We're, uh, I rather optimistically suggested we finish Hamlet. I'm not sure we're going to get that far, but particularly in view of the fact that we have a number of other things that I thought would be nice to do, including uh, some poetry. Okay, let's share the screen here. Straighten things out and get things figured out first. Screen share. Yes, thank you. Does this look fine? That looks pretty good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Let's turn that one off, perhaps. And we'll all see things a little bit better. Okay. Now, uh, so Mike is going to be uh, submitting stuff that he's been writing for the last, uh, well, for a couple of months there, right? Um, no, it was, it was a month, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, on, on your travels, and you are currently acting, or you have just finished yeah. being Huckleberry Finn in what kind of production was it? What, it was uh, a musical, Tom Sawyer the Musical. I see, yeah, I see. But it's Tom Sawyer the Musical, yeah. not Huck Finn. So I, I wasn't the main character. Right, but not the titular. It was character. one of them. Right. Very good, very good. No, it would be nice to see, and it would be nice to see the uh, the video. Mm -hmm. if, if it's going to be somewhere or other, even if it's only partial or fragmentary, we should link to it in the classroom. All right. Okay. Um, we have been working with, uh, uh, with Hamlet, and we did a number of scenes from that. Uh, Xander, you did a very nice recitation last week for which credit, and so did Anza, and you received credit on that. Uh, see if you can, wherever is comfortable for you. Uh, if you sit that close to the screen, you might have trouble seeing it, also. Okay. We are off and going. Um, now, I, I have updated a few things in the, uh, uh, in the agenda. And also in uh, in our uh, resources that you may not have noticed at the time. One of the assignments for today was to choose an article, a paper, by one of a number of people. Although you know very well that you're not restricted to the ones I give you. If you can find somebody else out there who's writing on that kind of a level, I'd be surprised if you can because I've been looking for a long time. That's perfectly fine. Um, I added one to the list. Uh, let, let's take a look at the high priority assignments right now and just get a, a concept for that. Uh, I put the material from Hamlet right in the agenda here, so let's skip through that and look at the uh, high priority assignments. And I added to this because last week I asked specifically <laughs> Of those uh, pieces that I gave you, that sort of collection of classical pieces from uh, the 17th and 18th centuries primarily, the, the major composers of whom you've probably heard, uh, I asked what were your favorites and what people would like to hear more of, and the answer was Bach, and I cannot disagree with that. Bach is sort of, some people have said Bach is, uh, um, all of music is sort of ramping up to and then influenced by Bach. And in a way, there's justification for that. Have you all had a chance to listen to those uh, those pieces? 
Very good. Yes. Uh, and your favorite of those, Sander? I didn't try to pick one. I just listened to them all and liked them all. Okay. And the last one, uh, I added that one later. Uh, you would have had to see that because I noticed at the time the only person who had seen them was Diana. And so having added it after that, I'm assuming you all saw the uh, Chacon at the end. That's not the most accessible piece in the world. It is terribly complex, and the complexity might make it rather difficult to understand or appreciate it, but it's one of the most amazing pieces in the world. Solo violin, and it's often got, yeah, it sounds like a whole orchestra, some of it, with multiple lines going through. Every major violinist has done a recording of it. I recommend the recordings by Han and Fisher those are absolutely superb. The one that I chose, Benedetti, she's a rather minor violinist as far as I can tell. Uh, she's a, actually, she, she's a Scotsman. <laughs> she's, her name sounds Italian, but listen to her, you can tell. And uh, I like this recording because the ones by Fisher and Han are simply audio. And this one, you can actually see her playing the instrument. And she seemed to be playing in a cistern or something. It's incredible acoustics. And so I just thought it was one wonderful. What did you folks think of the uh, the Chacon, the very last one in the uh, oh, I didn't see that one. Uh, I must you, have you should seen it, yeah. After or before you had posted that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, you may well have seen one of the other others that I posted. So uh, any thoughts on 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 those pieces at all? Well, I really like the Chacon. You, you did. And uh, you saw the little interview uh, of uh, uh, Nicola Benedetti before the Chacon. It's wonderful. I mean, she talks about what's going on in it, which is which is rather important. Yeah. Any of the other pieces specifically appeal? A Little Fugue. Is always... A Little Fugue is amazing, mm -hmm. isn't it? And uh, the, the visuals yeah. Are, are so wonderful there because you can see the lines going yeah, through. Yeah, that was really cool. And I showed can, it to both my parents and they're odd. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the lines, the fugal uh, concept. Uh, does everybody understand what a fugue is? It's just when uh, multiple parts are played at different times, but it's kind of the same thing. Right. You have a fugue theme, and then that uh, theme continues to enter, while the original theme continues in counterpoint to the new entrance. Mm -hmm. And it can be done off, sometimes at varying intervals, uh, often in uh, in different keys. Uh, so it's, it's really a fascinating structure. And in a way, I liken it to the structure of a well-composed scanning and rhyming poem, because you have a structure to adhere to, but at the same time you have immense freedom to do all kinds of uh, wonderful things with it. It's, in a way, it's a it's an audible poem. Mm -hmm. Okay, so wonderful things there. Uh, please choose an article. I added Miller later, and he uh, I don't think he went out in the uh, in the version that was sent out to the class. But I, I wasn't really sure that he had written much in the way of articles and papers. He's written a number of books and is, cer is certainly responsible for the production of a number of uh, uh, operas and Shakespeare productions, as well as doing all kinds of other wonderful things. But uh, his language is consistently superb. And he's safe in the sense that he doesn't resort to potty humor and things like that the way the others tend to. Uh, you, you won't hear him using words that are unacceptable in a classroom. Fry and Hitchens, however, you got to be careful with, but their their language wonder is wonderful. Fisk does not either, but then Fisk only talks about the Middle East most of the time, and it's all political. Uh, Eagleton, you've seen some of Eagleton already. He's he's an odd bird, but listen to his language. Um, in Fry's uh, book on poetry which I think you've all looked at because we had it in the classroom. In the uh, appendix at the end, he gives a, note, a lot of other resources. And at one point in the appendix, he says, and anything Eagleton writes. <laughs> and Berlinski, wonderful. 
uh, he, he's he's the one American in the group. Well, American in a sense. He speaks a dozen different languages. Uh, okay. Uh, how many people did bring something specifically? Um, uh, uh, a commentary or a review of any of the papers there? Either for oral presentation or written presentation. If not now, then at some point in the future. Does any, did anybody read any, and uh, do you have any questions about them? I only saw the assignment today. Okay. I read one, but I didn't know I was supposed to have some prepared for it. Well, not necessarily. They're, 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 they're in, the intent is to inspire you to either write or speak on the subject. And so if they didn't succeed in doing that, well, look at look at something else and see see if you can find something that does, and I will continue to search further. Okay, uh, then we're being rather optimistic here in read watch the remainder of Hamlet. <laughs> uh, there's quite a bit of it left to to do, and so I don't know that we'll finish that necessarily today. Tell me, did anybody look at this one? <laughs> I did. <laughs> <Okay>. Yeah, <laughs> highly inaccurate. Yeah, I had noticed. Um, there are others in which they, they have an accurate uh, um, subtitle, uh, oh, subtitle yeah. arrangement. Because the subtitles were just the original. The subtitles were the original, yeah. and they had rewritten it. And uh, I understand, in fact, that Christopher Plummer did not like the translation of to be or not to be and insisted on having it changed because it just didn't resonate well. The Klingon uh, language was not up to his, his expectations, and they did change it. And so uh, a number of changes were made in there in the translation, but that was an interesting concept. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, there are, are longer videos than this. This one was just the, uh, the soliloquy. But there are others, just particularly the one in which it's introduced, and uh, Klingon is sitting together with the others at the table, and you, you, you can't appreciate Shakespeare until you've read it in the original Klingon. Okay. Oh, I didn't even say to anybody what this was, and yet you all seem to have found it. So <laughs> wonderful. Okay. Uh, I left that one in there in case anybody hadn't uh, seen or read it yet. The uh, placing a damper on uh, democratic dissent. Do you get a chance to see that, Michael? Okay. I think when I. That one or a different one, I think it was that one. When I tried to look at it, um, it was a part of a different class. It was a part of academic English. Oh, if I got the wrong uh, link in there. Oh, crumbs. I'll, tr I'll fix that. I'll fix that. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, I do have an academic English class. In fact, that's where I do some of my writing. I find that it's easiest to write in Moodle. And then put it in Word afterwards if, if I want to, because you've got all of these extra tools that you can add to your um, your Firefox uh, for composition purposes. But uh, yeah, that, that was just another Moodle classroom I was using there. Thank you. I will fix that. Okay, David Crystal on idioms. You've all seen all of these, I believe. If you haven't, please look at them. The persuasive speeches. This is a marvelous collection. I've added one more. Uh, but I put it under the secondary priority. Hamlet, a small rewrite. Uh, Micah, you're probably the only one who hasn't seen that one yet. Uh, please do. Right. And here we've got the uh, Rosencrantz Guildenstern, which we may in fact visit today, depending on how much interest there is in doing so. Secondary priority resources. I happen to see this moving speech. When you search something on uh, YouTube, it knows what you like, and it starts bringing up similar things. So having looked for moving speeches, it brings up others. And so I saw this one out there. It's not bad, but it's interesting to note that when you're finished and you ask, what did he say, it's hard to come up with a reasonable answer to that question. And that, that makes you wonder whether it's more polish, more, uh, more poignancy, and less content in a sense, than, than perhaps it could be. That's exactly the same uh, the same reaction I heard of people who had listened to Hitler speaking. He was uh, extremely uh, 
uh, persuasive and moving, but they couldn't summarize it or come up with anything solid that he'd actually said afterwards. And so it's an interesting point. I think Sheen has some very good things to say, but uh, that that was that was a demonstration of the art of rhetoric. Okay, and Maysfield's Maritime uh, first page. Has anybody looked at that? Uh, I think I have. Okay, good. There, there's one piece from there that I thought might be nice to look at today, and of course. When we do finish Hamlet, or even if before we finish Hamlet, let's look at this collection of quotes. Oh, yeah, I did see that. Good. I read all of them. And to uh, place them and understand where they came from. Okay, let's go on here. And I wanted to share something because poems have been coming through. I think we'll look at that one a little later. Uh, poems have been coming through on a number of subjects. And when I see that, I really don't want to uh, criticize the poems that have been submitted, but to continue on with the same inspiration that caused them to come into being in the first place. And uh, Tolkien, of course, is one. Tolkien wrote some wonderful poetry and included it in there, and wrote a lot of wonderful poetry that isn't included in his major works. But this is by someone else altogether whom I discovered a number of years ago. As far as I know, it's never been published anywhere, except perhaps on my pages. I corresponded with the author and got his permission to, uh, to, uh, to include it on a page. And this is called A Voyage to Middle Earth. Let's just take a quick look at it. It's important here to realize that the author of this, as you very quickly learn, uh, is very familiar with Middle Earth and all of the uh, the aspects of it, the languages and the characters and the people's themes. Okay, boys to Middle Earth. Um, perhaps before we start, I should say that uh, should ask where does uh, where is Middle Earth? Where does it take place? Where do all of these wonderful stories happen? Okay. Second, where is Middle where Earth? Where is Middle Earth? Yes. On Earth? Yes. Or or anywhere. I mean, what? Where is it? Um, it's in the east of Arda, but I don't know where that actually is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, yeah, it's an interesting point because Tolkien makes it fairly clear in various places that Middle Earth uh, is not a, a fictitious or invented place. It's a fictitious or invented time. But the place is, is, is Western Europe. Hmm. And so uh, you sort of realize that, yes, that's the, the area we're setting in, but it's the, uh, the time is, uh, uh, is a, a fantasy. It's, it's a fantasy time. And so, so what that, country did he put Mordor in? Well, that's an interesting <laughs> point. It, it's probably down there by the Black Sea. Maybe it's... Okay. Uh, uh, it's uh, in the... Southeast, right? Right, uh, by uh, uh, Romania or Bulgaria or one of one of those. So I'm just hence, guessing. Here. This is Middle Earth. In is this Middle Earth in um, Lord of the Rings only, or does it include the Silmarillion? The Silmarillion's Middle Earth is a bit different, isn't it? I mean, it's had a whole lot of uh, quite a different territory. Um, I don't know that it's that well defined, but this is my understanding of uh, the okay. interpretation of his uh, ancillary writings. Let's look at this, and yeah, you you notice the things that go by. Find me a ship that can sail on the sea, whose waves are the passed away years. Over the ocean of dreams, let it be, sweet Middle Earth's shore that she nears. Voyage to Enerath, tree tangled land. To find my old friends faring well, take dwarf, elf, hobbit, and wizard, wizard by hand, and hear the, what news they will tell. Wander in Lorient, try to console Galadriel's elven lament. Party with Bombadil, merry old soul, at leisure converse with an ent. Fly with the eagles, look down on the graves where dragon and Valrog once fell. Stand on the shore and look over the waves toward where the Valar now dwell. Journey to Mead Halls astride the steeds of Rohan that race like the wind. 
Hark to the harpers, and hear of the deeds of those who sought virtue or sinned. Listen to lore of the long ago times before Sauron dared to attack. Hear how his creatures accomplished his crimes and how the free folk brought him back. Join in the praise of the courage they showed by facing the fear, fell fearsome foe. Joy in the peace and the wisdom be, uh, bestowed, sorry, joy in the peace and the freedom bestowed on good folk to flourish, flourish and grow. Let me sing with them the songs of the quest, the heroes, the brave and the fair. Let me hear legends of Middle Earth's best, but most of all, let me be there. Now this is, this is well constructed. Do you see, see what I mean? One of the things you can see here very clearly is he started with the last line. That's where he wanted to end. That's where he wanted to land. And he led up to it and found it beautifully. And despite my fumbling around here, we've got these wonderful little clumps of alliteration, the fell fearsome foe, for example. And every syllable almost is in the right place. You'll notice I left a couple out because it worked better that way. <laughs> um, astride on the steeds. It didn't work. I, I, I don't regard that phrase is particularly good, and you don't need all those syllables, so it could be fixed. Anyway, um, do you understand all of the references in here? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, I'm not Valar. Okay, the, the Valar, of course. The Valar are, um, are that's the one gosh. thing from the Silmarillion. Okay. Yeah. They're right. like the gods, basically. basically. They live in the West. Valinor is, is mm -hmm. the, the country of the gods that was at one time accessible to the West, mm -hmm. but the, uh, the but that was before the, the oceans uh, were, were curved, and just, uh, that that was done so that they could no longer be accessible after mm -hmm. that point. An interesting idea. And that's where, in fact, the, uh, the Noldor and Elves came from when they came to the uh, to the web, to the uh, to Middle Earth. Okay. It's now, uh, other things, of course, you recognize all of these. We've got the dragon and the Balrog. We've got Bombadil, Mario. I've Sir. never seen a dragon. Oh yeah. Well, of course, there were other dragons too. Yes. <laughs> Lalo, yeah, the, I the like, other. No, no, I meant I've never seen a dragon in Lord of the Rings, but then I thought of a Hobbit, and I was like, oh wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And, and so the Silmarillion has quite a bit. But, uh, of course, we've got the Balrog there, and uh, important things like at leisure converse with an Ent. If you recall, Ents required a great deal of leisure if you wanted to converse with them. There is a place in the first or second um, stanza? stanza Yeah, that they mentioned I didn't recognize. Um, Enerath, I have no idea who heard that. Right, right. Again, this... Uh, uh, stems from the fact that the author uh, was definitely an expert. Uh, Enerath is another name for Middle Earth. He had many uh, names for everything, and it, literally it means tree tangled line. So he did his his uh, uh, his, he did his homework, and uh, some of the things he's written a number of other things as well. <clears throat> and I found myself going to the dictionary. He knows his words and he loves his words. I want, to, I want to share one more thing with you which is not specifically Tolkien, although Tolkien's material is mentioned therein. Uh, this is a, a marvelous poem uh, which is about a number of different uh, traditions. Uh, has everybody read it or anybody? Great. Now, it, it mentions a number of different traditions including Beowulf, Mm -hmm. uh, you all know about Beowulf and Herod Hall and Grendel and mm -hmm. the, the battles and so forth. And, of course, uh, the Arthurian legends with uh, Arthur and the right before might and so forth. And uh, the other one, of course, who is La Mancha's woeful knight? Knight of La Mancha. Yes. What's his name? Uh, um, Don Quixote. Yeah, Don Quixote. Yeah. Very good, very good. And um, uh, Don Quixote at one point insists on being dubbed a knight by the lord of the of the castle, which actually meant the innkeeper. 
yeah. and uh, who deigns to do so and actually dubs him and then he said, but you're supposed to give the knight a new name. Does anybody remember what name he gave him? Knight of the Woeful Countenance. At least that's the, the way it's translated. And so that's, that's important to understand too because the author of this poem understood all those things and tied them in for people who would know the answer to those questions. I'm just going to read the beginning of this. It's too long. <clears throat> friend, when you were I'm sorry, friend, when you and I were younger, and the world was strange and vast, how our eager hearts would hunger for legends of the past, dreams of swords and spears uplifted, gleaming armor in the sun, streams of banners bravely flying where the battle had begun. Oh, to see the truth triumph, setting right ahead of might. Hear the gentle judgments afterwards by court in, at court by candlelight, or the revelry and laughter while the merry minstrels sing of Herod Hall with Grendel gone and to Camelot in spring. We have joined in joy and sadness with each hero in his plight, shared the fine inspired madness of La Mancha's woeful night. Parents little know the path they chart for children when they bring all the stories, songs, and sagas about Camelot. Hmm. Camelot. That's exactly. How those visions filled our childhood, strengthened us as nothing could, put our world in moral order, set our standard of the good. For the lessons that we heeded, shining from the printed page, were the virtues that were needed to bring on the golden age. But perhaps our elders mocked our dreams of dragons and their hordes. So for lack of worthy foes, we packed away our magic swords. Then our schools and jobs distracted us with all the work they bring. And no more we thought of Herod and Camelot in spring. Bid farewell to bold adventures and our comrades of the mind, to the wizards wise and subtle and the ladies fair and kind, to the knights of the round table, and the fellows of the ring, farewell Narnia and Middle Earth and Camelot. Notice the themes that he runs through this. He ends everything with Camelot in spring, mm -hmm. which is a pretty good rhyme because ing rhymes with a whole lot of stuff. And so um, that made it uh, possible and uh, gave you that consistency in it. And then there are, there are wonderful other things taking place in it. Uh, there's um, I'm trying to look. There, there's an internal rhyme here that I saw <laughs> and, uh, and I've forgotten where it was. But of course this I think is, is the crux of the whole thing. What, what an amazing uh, set of words that he's managed to put together here and, and link. And the structure itself is interesting. He's got eight lines and then four. Eight lines and then four. It's a rhymed in couplets, which makes it nice and easy to recognize uh, and hear in, in your ears. But uh, he's divided it into those eight lines and then four lines. And there's a difference in the theme of the eight lines and four lines. There's the body of it and then sort of a synopsis and a conclusion based on each one of them. And of course, this line is absolutely amazing. We've joined in joy and sadness with each hero in his plight, shared the fine inspired madness of La Mancha's woeful night. That's that's just just amazing. Anyway, I recommend it. Read the rest of it. Uh, it's, it's remarkable stuff. Okay. I leave it up to you folks what you would like to go on to next. We have all of your work has been handed in, and there have been some useful things, perhaps useful things, said about it. Uh, we have Hamlet. We have another poem that I threw in here that I thought might be interesting because pirates seem to be a major theme that we keep revisiting uh, in the class. And uh, it's actually a fascinating theme, I think, the concepts of pirates. Uh, many people have found it fascinating at various times for other reasons. Uh, the reason I 
regards uh, piracy is rather fascinating is that the pirates uh, created a culture that was in so many ways much more enlightened than the culture that they were fighting against. The, uh, the culture of the, all of these countries with their navies was based on a caste system and a class system that uh, as often as not uh, pressed sailors into service and there was no opportunity for rising in the ranks. It was thoroughly undemocratic. The, uh, the uh, officers were always uh, patricians of some sort. They were members of the aristocracy. And then there were uh, press, gra press gangs who uh, uh, conscripted the, uh, the ordinary sailors. Uh, and many of them did decide it was, well, let's run off and start our own. And that's, that's where they, uh, a lot of the pirates came from. And uh, 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 what was interesting was the pirate ship itself was a democratic body. It was one person, one vote, regardless of race, regardless of gender. There were female pirate captains. We don't hear a lot about that, but it was true. Uh, and uh, it was really an example, in a way, of democracy. I mean, there were dreadful things that took place on both sides in all of the uh, battles between the, uh, the different countries and the pirates. But uh, it, it was an example of democracy, which really was even more democratic than when it officially developed in this country. Because it, it was it was thoroughly demotic. It was a one person one vote. Anyway, it's an it's an interesting thing to study, and you don't see that picture in so much of the fictionalized versions, because it's been uh, interpreted out of it. And I thought I'd just throw this one in. Uh, one of my favorite poems is uh, a poet poets is uh, uh, John Macefield. And he was poet laureate in England for uh, many years and uh, wrote largely about the sea and uh, did so beautifully. And this is one of the options that we can jump into and do right now. So we've got three, really. Shall we uh, do projects? Shall we do Hamlet? Shall we uh, do a poem first? Well, Anne and I have to leave uh, in, uh, what, 15, 25 minutes? Um. Oh, okay. So you have to leave earlier than you, or we have to leave at the same time. You have to leave yeah. at the same time in 15 minutes. I guess so. Well, it's oh, yeah, there's a clock. It's uh, well, the class doesn't end until four. Oh, and mm -hmm. oh yeah, but <laughs> but yeah, but 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 we have something. Going you on. have something special going on today. Yeah. Okay, let's do projects first, then, shall we? Okay. Or. If you prefer, we can uh, let's let's do your two projects. In any case, we'll start start that right there. Okay, Dawson, you have <clears throat> expanded upon your piratical uh, uh, peregrinations, if you'd like. Uh, nicely done, well written. Uh, little things I wanted to change in there. I I enjoyed very much your uh, use of the, the word feral which is a, a very appropriate, but when you use a word like that, don't use it again. Do you, see, do you see what I mean? Because an unusual word sticks out even more if you end up uh, pleonastically repeating it. And so uh, suddenly they saw a feral goat bursting out of the bushes quickly and rather unexpectedly, followed by none other than incognito, who seemed to be chasing the feral goat. Okay, chasing it would have been fine. Chasing, find something else. The artiodactyl, or the capri nor here seen interloper, or I just, just suggestions of uh, alternative. It's interesting that goat actually has two adjectival forms that uh, that are unlike the word itself altogether. Of course, from various different sources. Okay. Nicely done. Nicely I done. think you missed yeah. something. Where should not have an H? 
I think, very possibly, where are you? Right here. Right there where your mouse is, actually. Okay. Where's Last time we that? saw you, absolutely. And that's a typo, I'm sure. Very good. Good for you. Okay. And I saw your crew, and now all of a sudden you are changing, chasing a feral goat, and here we have it again. Oh, okay, that, that's sorry. that's that's all right. It's just general generally to be avoided. Okay, and uh, here Incognito didn't seem pleased with this, but he thought he did have a point about when would the next ship pass by was the original, and of course, I have a point about when the next ship would pass by. Clearly, sounds better, don't don't you agree? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, and then uh, Margarita, without firing a single shot, and even capturing, to take that word out, a ship of the line, try to keep things parallel. Parallelism is extremely important, and it you, you want the parallelism parallelism in your ear, and your uh, your readers will recognize uh, when it, when it strays. Let's read the whole thing here. Uh, while dining, someone asked Incognito about what he had done as a pirate. Uh, it soon, I would say, became apparent, certainly, that uh, he was rather gifted when it came to the subject, including sacking Margarita without firing a single shot and even capturing a ship of the line. Now, you see, sacking is the first verb. Uh, and these are all under including, including sacking, but we don't have to, don't want to say including had captured. That doesn't work. We want to make sure that everything fits together right. Once you've created the parallelism, keep it parallel throughout. Okay. Okay. And uh, this is a nice, uh, just a nice plot device. This this concept of the time travel here that you're working with. And a nice description here. The sea was rough, and the blistering wind was harsh and cold. Nice. Very good. Uh, there's repetition going on here. They were now lost in an unknown region of the world. Little was known about this region. I'm sure we can find another word for region so that we don't have to uh, repeat it like that. Uh, okay. Actually done. Any questions? No. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, okay. And uh, uh, yeah, the impact of language and the uh, technology's impact on language. Nicely done. One project. Note a few problems. And please ask if you don't understand them. Your points are well taken, but it's important to understand that every change in language has been opposed by conservative and atavistic pockets in society. Mm -hmm. I've got to give you a word to look up once in a while. Oh, I did. Did you look it up? Oh, yes. Good for you. Good for you. That's that's wonderful. And those who do attempt to suppress neologisms tend to fail eventually. It's important to distinguish between new language that develops to fill a need and new language that develops through ignorance of an existing solution to the problem. I've said that before, of course, but I think it's rather important that uh, when new language is created by uneducated people who simply don't know enough about their own language to know that there are other solutions to it, those neologisms tend, hopefully, well, I shouldn't use the word hopefully, I'm sure you've looked that one up, but uh, they, they tend to uh, produce ephemeral entities and the language that results from that is likely to be ignored by educated people who know the better way to say it. Okay, and the grievous state of modern education tends to cause the latter to proliferate. Okay. Um, um, important things here. You understand what's going on here, right? Yes. Okay. Mass nouns and count nouns. We've got to distinguish them. And here we've got good use of the subjunctive. Uh, be it in an office situation. Very nice. Very nice. That's exactly what it should be. And then here, I just thought that another word would be better. Mm -hmm. I find the widespread use of media and the internet 
my letter writing has lessened since then. Well, it has lessened, but yes, deteriorated. I, I think you meant deteriorated mm -hmm. rather than been reduced in quantity. It was reduced in quality. Yeah. Um, okay, I look up the usage note for uh, a while mm -hmm. and uh, when it's preceded by preposition and cross caustic through a three. Okay, and this is good when you can put together something that is solid and impressive to end with. Uh, these things may uh, never have known. There are things we may never have known, things that could have been forgotten and things that may never have been. So that's very nice. That's very nice. That's anaphora. Remember that one? Great. Uh, starting multiple clauses with this with the same idea. Okay, excellent. Let's look at uh, this one. Heather has presented something. There was a bomb here suggesting probably that somebody is out there. Uh, that was me. Sorry. That was you. Okay. I was just asking if anyone was out there. Okay, Heather. Uh, this is a poem, and this is a poem which. Uh, she explains is, is inspired by Tolkien, though it's clearly not very obvious that that's the case. Endless voices in my head, hear the murmur of the dead, and yet here we must tread. That actually scans fairly well. Noiselessly they begin to follow. Well, why don't we have too many syllables there? Let you start instead of begin. I just made a suggestion there. As your heart begins to hollow. We don't want to have all those begins, I don't think. And so we have noiselessly they start to follow as your heart begins to hollow and the festering fear to wallow. Notice that I can just leave that one out because the previous line uh, has supplied the verb for us. Now, I didn't go through the entire thing, but, uh, um, but thou must go ever on scans much better. You need those syllables there. But thou must go ever on, uh, knowing thou shalt see. Uh, I would say knowing thou shalt not see the dawn, because that would give you the syllables you need there. Let's see if you have the brawn, all right? Um, I would reverse those, because I think dawn is a stronger ending than brawn is, and uh, it would make better sense to try to put that at the end. Alas, you have proven true. Again, we could add some syllables there to make it work, and I didn't go through the rest of this, but uh, I'm hoping that uh, Heather will look at this and uh, perhaps expand it out and, and uh, repair it a little bit. But that's fine. I love to see uh, poetry attempted. Okay, we have Diana's here. And Diana's been handing in so many interesting things. Uh, Nice thinking and research, one project. Oh, note my miss, my typo there. <laughs> okay, note a few suggestions below and please post questions if you do not understand. Yes, low-tech solutions, and of course this is a question of whether uh, high-tech solutions or modern solutions are better than old-fashioned ones. Low-tech solutions may well be the best in many instances. However, it's interesting, and this is indeed, I think, interesting, to note that it is within the past century that the most remarkable progress has been made in archery equipment and hand spinning wheels, centuries after these devices stopped being important mainstays of economy and civilization. Uh, during the many centuries in which they were essential, very little progress was made. I expect that uh, those of you who have studied the history of weaponry are probably familiar with what I'm talking about, the, the, the most effective uh, advance in traditional artist, uh, uh, archery uh, with the development of the longbow and eventually the development of the recurve bow. But in both cases, if you do a mathematical analysis of uh, the efficacy, they fall very short of the modern uh, compound bow. And uh, what one can look at that and then realize, you know, they relied on these things for centuries, but they never figured out how to do them right. <laughs> and we only figured those out fairly recently. 
let's let's look at this a little bit more. Whether or not it makes sense to think of a new solution or use an old one depends on a variety of aspects. I think factors is a clearly better word there than, uh, than aspects. Um, aspects are usually facets or uh, faces of something or other, characteristics of something. Whereas a factor would be uh, more appropriate here. Um, interestingly, uh, Diana tends to have difficulties with articles and missing articles where they belong and superfluous articles where they don't. Don't know why. Uh, though uh, that's certainly the case in a number of languages for people coming from certain language backgrounds. Okay, solar ovens allow people to cook food without electricity and combat malnutrition while countering the need for food, perhaps eliminating the need for food. Does that make sense? Okay, you two, I can I can see are are anxious and need to take off for some. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, conflict here. So uh, we will see you next week then. Mm. Thank you for your contributions. Thank you. We'll be able to go on and that's what we do. I'm sorry, we won't have to, uh, to help us read through Hamlet. Oh, who's, who's there? Oh, there's Diana. Wonderful. Uh, Diana, would you like to do a recitation? Uh, Ну, тут я бы это честно не предложил. Не, ну, не, ну, проходи мне платить, что он куда мне ты хочешь. Can you turn up the of the volume a little bit or stand closer to the microphone? So I to, to tell you the truth, I'm not sure whether it's uh, my ears, the sound reproduction on this system, or the language, but it sounds like Klingon to me. I'm sure it's French. Is it French? Yeah, that's okay. okay. <laughs> um, Diana, would you mind? Go no, you don't have a mic. Well, you've got to be speaking into something. Um, we can hear you. We, we can hear you. Uh, what is your? Uh, what was it that you were reciting? I can't hear enough words to. Вот они мешают вам, думают, что я лисачу. Нет. Наша. Я думаю, это английский. Диана, can you speak a little louder? Uh, no, I don't have. Diana, you're doing just fine. We uh, we just can't hear consistently. Не, не вот, у меня выключено все. Нету. Okay, well, uh, Diana, I we can hear you, but not very well. So if you would like to do a recitation, please go right ahead and let us know, and we'll do that. I can see that you're there, and what I can type to you. But uh, while you don't want us to hear you, please just uh, turn off your microphone, okay? <coughs> okay. Um, please type uh, type into the chat room there if you uh, if you want to participate, 
and uh, do a recitation or say something, okay? I can hear you, but it's not very loud, and I've turned up the volume all the way. Yeah. You've seen Dr. Horrible sing a lot of blood. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, go ahead and type something in if you if you need to, uh, but clearly. Uh, You'll have to talk very close to the microphone or the uh, tablet. She's not reciting anything. Okay. Well, that, that's fine then. Um, if you don't want us to hear you, then uh, go ahead and just mute your microphone. And then you can unmute it uh, uh, anytime you want to say something, okay? All right. We're going to go back into... Uh, Diana's request, which was Hamlet. We have an awful lot of Hamlet here to go through and some wonderful material in Hamlet. Let's take a look at it. This is all in the agenda, so uh, you all have received it. And uh, a little bit of overlap with what we discussed and went through last week. And of course here uh, we have Claudius who's trying to glean what's going on with Hamlet and hopes to remedy it if he can figure out what it is. He's suspicious that Hamlet is suspicious. Uh, so uh, he says, love, his affections do not that way tend, nor what he spake, though it lacked form a little, was not like madness. There's something in his soul or which his melancholy sits on brood, and I do doubt the hatch and the disclose will be some danger, which for to prevent, I have in quick determination thus set it down, he shall with speed to England. If you got a problem, send it to England. Okay, and so uh, he's figured out what he's going to do with it, but uh, let's, let's see what goes on here. Um, Polonius still thinks that uh, he's lovelorn and uh, talks to Ophelia uh, and uh, suggests that Hamlet's mother talk to him after the play and try to bring him out. Okay, uh, it shall be so, madness in great ones must not unwatched go, indeed. Uh, that's an important line. Okay, now this is, uh, this part, uh, we did a little of this last week, and uh, I thought it was really so, so poignant and so, uh, cogent what uh, Hamlet has to say about the world of acting because of course we have the great playwright speaking about what acting ought to be and he's speaking it through the, the mouth of Hamlet so it's a little hard to tell how much of this is Shakespeare and how much Hamlet because indeed it's a bit arrogant for this prince to be telling the players how to act these players are amazing. They, they, they have this vast repertory at their immediate uh, beck and call, and they know what they're doing and has been demonstrated in that earlier scene. Uh, a remarkable ability to act is being described here, and nobody could describe it like Shakespeare does. Mm -hmm. But uh, here Hamlet is telling them how to, how to act. And I suspect that a lot of this is is, uh, is rather important. Oh, how are you doing? Hi. We were just how talking about you. Okay, I'm not going to uh, uh, going to push it on you. You feel like doing a recitation? Huh? <laughs> That's all right. Uh, if, you, uh, if something inspires, let us know. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Okay, so Hamlet here is talking to the players and speak the speech. I pray you as I pronounced it, trippingly on the tongue. But if you mouth it, as many of our players do, I had as leaf the town crier spoke my lines. Nor do not saw the air too much with your hands thus, but use all gently, for in the very torrent, tempest, 
And as I may say, the whirlwind of passion, you must acquire and beget a temperance that may give it smoothness. Oh, it offends me to the soul to hear a robustious periwig pated fellow tear a passion to tatters, to very rags, to split the ears of the groundlings, who for the most part are capable of nothing but inexplicable dumb shows and noise. I would have such fellows whip for or doing termagant. It out Herod's Herod. Play you avoid, pray you avoid it. Wonderful stuff here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think Diana said something. Yes, uh, Diana, uh, what, what were you saying? Let me check. Uh, yeah, you just said I, I don't have my. What were you saying? Okay. So, a termagant is a shrew. Okay. Is there, are there any other words up there that are uh, causing any problem? It's, it's beautifully stated, isn't it? And so he has, he has put down uh, some lines to be added to the play. Mm -hmm. And so let, let's, let's go on here quickly. Uh, be not too tame neither, but let your own discretion be your tutor. It's Slavic, it's not French. Oh. Yeah. Diana? I, I'm afraid that your uh, your your contributions here are not really uh, uh, audible or understandable. Perhaps you could turn off your microphone. Otherwise, I'll just turn down the sound. Uh, are you there? Probably too much of a delay. I'm going to turn the sound down just just for the time being. Uh, okay, Diana. Uh, if you need to or want to say something, just uh, post something in the uh, uh, in the chat room. I'll put that in here. I just wanted to say thank you for the game and everything. Yes, he already has it already. Then he went to Hamlet. Now, why wasn't I able to reduce that volume down? Okay. So I don't believe that was intended for us. Okay, so he goes on here about... Uh, how to play. And, and this is beautiful, so let's just look at it quickly. Does somebody else want to read it? Someone ready to cold read some Shakespeare? Sure. Go ahead. Be not too tame, neither. Let your own discretion be your tutor. Suit the action to the word, the word to the action, with this special observance, that you overstep not the modesty of nature, for anything so overdone is from the purpose of playing, whose end, both at first and now, was and is to hold, as twere, the mirror up to nature, to show virtue her own feature, scorn her own image, and the very age and body of the time of his form and pleasure. Pressure. Now this overdone all come tardy off, though it make the unskillful laugh, cannot but make the judicious grieve. The censure of which, of the which, mu one must, in your allowance, overweigh a whole theatre of others. Oh, there be players that I have seen play and heard others praise, and that highly, not to speak of it profanely, that neither having the accent of Christians nor the gait of Christian pagan nor man have so strutted and bellowed that I have thought some of nature's journeymen have made men and not made them well. They imitated humanity so abominably. Abominably. Nicely done. Nice RP. 
Okay. Now here we go on to the next uh, next little bit. This is just up here, from, uh, not so much for the language as for the plot. There's a play before the king, and uh, and uh, Hamlet is explaining to Horatio that he has arranged it such that uh, it will mimic closely the murder of his father as described by the ghost, and tells him, watch Claudius so that you can tell what his reaction is. Well, they didn't have to watch very closely, did they? Okay, and so they, they will indeed watch him. Okay, what uh, should a man do but be merry? For look you, how cheerfully my mother looks, and my father died within two hours. Ophelia responds, Nay, tis twice two months, Lord. Uh, so long? Nay, then, let the devil wear black, for I'll have a suit of sables. Oh, heavens, died two months ago, and not forgotten yet. Then there's hope, a great man's memory. May outlive his uh, life half a year. But by a lady, he must build churches then, or else he shall suffer. Uh, not thinking on with the hobby horse whose epitaph is for oh for oh the hobby horse is forgot. Talking about uh, memory enduring, and the player king says, "Tis deeply sworn, sweet, leave me here a while. My spirits grow dull, and fain would I beguile the tedious day with sleep." What a wonderful way of saying it. I'm sorry. Uh, anybody else ready to? Oh, but this is just running back and forth here. Um, okay, I'm, I'm going to jump forward a little bit so that we can uh, fix a little bit. Now, of course, we've got the, the, the poison. The mixture rank of midnight weeds collected, with Hecate's band thrice blasted, twi thrice infected, thy natural magic and dire property on wholesome life usurp immediately. Poise the po pours the poison into the sleeper's ears. It's very hard for me to imagine how, what posture the sleeper is in that you can manage to pour it in both of his ears. Yeah. <laughs> Just, he goes... <laughs> <laughs> he poisoned the garden for its sake. And Hamlet is explaining this. <laughs> Okay, and as Hamlet explains what has just happened there, the king rises. And Ophelia the king notes, rises. <laughs> yeah. uh, what? Frighted nice with false fire? How fares, Lord? Give o'er the play. Give o'er or give over. It's interesting, in some uh, British dialects, that's still used for stop, uh, especially if somebody else is saying, saying something particularly stupid. Give over. Uh, but it's it's not that that common. We don't use it in this country. Okay, give some light away. Lights and body leaves. Okay. Lights, lights, lights. Uh, I'll find find the next big one here. Let's do something with it. Um, ah, here Hamlet is uh, is trying to get Guildenstern to play on a pipe. And uh, tells him, it's easy as lying. Go with these uh, vent, uh, vintages with your fingers and thumb. Give it breath with your mouth, and it will discourse most eloquent music. Look you, it, these are the stops. And Gilderson, but I cannot com uh, command to any utterance of harmony. I have not the skill. Okay, where's Hamlet going with this one? Would you like to do it? <laughs> Anybody? Same. Yeah, it's uh, doing it cold is tricky, but go ahead, Jack, if you'd like. Um, Can you see? I know. <laughs> Do you want to like move? Oh, I should do that. Uh, yeah, if you'd like. Um. Okay. No. Well, I look you now. How unworthy a thing you make of me. You would play upon me, you would seem to know my stop. You would pluck up the heart of my mystery. You would sound me from my lowest note to the top of my compass. And there is much music, excellent voice, in this little organ. If not, you make it speak. Is blood 
do you think I am easier to be played on than a pipe? Call me what instrument you will, though you cannot fret me, yet you cannot play upon me. Yeah. Although you can't fret me. So, so that's really rather clever. I can't play the pipe. You know, you think you can play on me better than you can play the pipe. Yes. Okay. And then uh, uh, Hamlet has been summoned to uh, to his mother's uh, chamber, and she wants to talk with him. And uh, uh, Polonius says, "Okay, I'll let her know you're coming. I'll let her know you're coming by and by," as he says. "By and by is easily said. Leave me, my friends." Okay, and now he has some pretty good idea of what he's going to do there. Any any volunteers for this one? Sure. I, won't, I, don't, I don't think I'll do it in accent, though. It's entirely up to you. You I, I did quite well. Tis now the very witching time of night, when churchyards yawn and hell itself breaks out. Contagion to this world. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> breaks out contagion to this world. Now could I drink hot blood and do such bitter business as the day would quake on, quick to look on. Soft now to my mother. O oh, heart, lose not thy nature. Let not ever the soul of Nero find this firm bosom. Let me be cruel, not unnatural. I will speak daggers to her, but use none. Yes, I will speak daggers to her, but use none. That's wonderful. Uh, yeah, they, they, the accents, of course, are people have gone round and round in circles about that. I find it a little jarring to hear it done in broad American mm -hmm. <laughs> somehow. But then broad American is is not that much different from the original as, uh, as RP is. So it's, mm -hmm. there's justification both ways. Uh, okay, so... Yes? Hello. Is um, he was sometime recently, but I really don't know where. Uh, do you know when he'll be back? I, I'm sorry. Is there anywhere where I can leave some paperwork for him? Um, if there's no one here at all, I suppose putting a note on it up uh, there would be. Yeah. Okay. Um, Thank you. Sure. Okay. Um, so th this is just uh, straightforward. My load, I'm going to the closet. I'm going to hide behind the curtain. Okay. And then we have this wonderful. Oh thing here. Who's up for this one? Do you remember seeing uh, uh, Patrick Stewart do this in the movie? Uh, watch that movie. Okay. You'll enjoy it. He does a wonderful right. job of it. Uh, let, let's just go through this because it's important to understand what's happening in Claudius's head. Uh, Claudius... Before or after he stabs Polonius? Um, this, this is still before. Okay. This is so he's still hot. Now, is still some, of, some of these things have been rearranged uh, in in different plays, and I know a lot of the scenes were rearranged in the uh, Tenet version, uh, and, and don't agree with the original text. So hard to know exactly. Okay, so here's Claudius, and he knows uh, he, he's he's feeling remorse. He's feeling contrition for what he has done, and indeed it's been thrust in front of him with the murder of Gonzago, and here he is uh, thinking about that. Shall I do it? Let's, let's, let's look at this. Oh, my offense is rank, it smells to heaven. It hath the primal eldest curse upon it, a brother's murder. Pray can I not. Though inclination be as sharp as will, my stronger guilt defeats my strong intent. And like a man, to double business bound, I stand in pause where I shall first begin, and both neglect. Boy, that's a theme that runs through the whole, uh, the whole plot, doesn't it? What if this cursed hand were thicker than itself with brother's blood? Is there not rain enough in the sweet heavens to wash it white as snow? Where two serves mercy, but to confront the visage of office, and what's in prayer but this twofold force to be forestalled ere we come to fall? Or pardon, being down, then I'll look up, my fault is past. But oh, what form of prayer can I serve my turn? 
forgive me my foul murder. That cannot be, since I am still possessed of those effects for which I did the murder. My crown, my own ambition, and my queen. May one be pardoned and retain the offense in the corrupt currents of this world. Offense's gilded hand may shelf by justice, and oft to seem the wicked prize itself buys out the law. But tis not so above. There is no shuffling. There the action lies in his true nature, and we ourselves compelled, each to the teeth and forehead of our faults, to give an, to give an evidence. What then? What rests? Try what repentance can. What can it not? Yet what can it when one cannot repent? O wretched state, O bosom black as death, O limed soul that struggling to be free art more engaged. Help, angels, make a say. Bow stubborn knees and heart with strings of steel. Be soft as sinews, the newborn babe. All may be well. And he kneels. And then Hamlet sees him kneeling there, has decided he knows he needs to kill him because he knows now that he's guilty, but he sees that he's praying. Now might I do it. Now he's praying, and now I'll do it. And so he goes to heaven, and so I am revenged. That would be scanned. A villain kills my father, and for that I, his sole son, do the same villain send to heaven. Oh, this is higher in salary, not revenge. He took my father grossly, full of bread, with all his crimes broad blown, as flush as may, and how his audit stands, who knows save heaven? But in our circumstance and course of thought, tis heavy with him, and I am then revenged to take him in the purging of his soul, when he is fit and seasoned for his passage. No, up sword, and no a more horrid end. When he is drunk asleep, or in his rage, or in the incestuous pleasure of his bed, at gaming, swearing, or about some act that has no relish of salvation in it, then trip him, that his heels may kick at heaven, and that his soul may be as damned and black as hell, whereto it goes. My mother stays. Pause, pause. My mother stays. This physic but prolongs thy sickly days. Okay. In other words, uh, you've got a brief repri reprieve, but that's just going to prolong your illness. And uh, decided now is simply not the time. I'll, t I'll find a time when... And it, uh, he talks about his father having been killed in some unknown state of repentance. And now he comes in and talks to the, his mother. And uh, boy, he's, uh, he really gives it to her. Uh, the, they, they go back and forth. We, we could go th uh, through this, to, uh, but you've all read it, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, Yeah, you are the queen, your husband's brother's wife, and were it not so, you are my mother. Nay, then, I'll set those to you that can speak. Come, come, and sit you down. You shall not budge. You shall not till I set you up a glass where you may see the inmost part of you. What, what wilt thou do? Thou wilt not murder me. And she calls for help. And when she calls for help, Polonius responds from, from behind the arras. And then Hamlet, realizing there's somebody back there, makes a quick decision. How now? A rat! Dead for a ducat. Dead. And stabs through the, uh, the curtain. 
Polonius, I am slain. We, oh, what hast thou done? Nay, I know not. Is it the king? <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> right. Oh, what a rash and bloody deed is this. A bloody deed, almost as bad, good mother, as kill a king and marry with his brother. Okay. Kill, as kill a king? I, lady, twas my word. Lifts up the arras and discovers Polonius. Thou wretched, rash, intruding fool, farewell. I took thee for thy better. I thought you were someone else. I thought you were somebody better. <laughs> okay, and then, oh, speak no more. These words like daggers enter in thine ears. No more, sweet Hamlet. Hamlet, a murderer and a villain, a slave that is not twentieth part of the tithe of your uh, precedent lord, a vice of kings, a cut purse of the empire. Though. I think I've, yeah, this, this is Hamlet speaking here. I've got the lines messed up. Uh. Yeah, so Hamlet uh, talks about the, the current king, a murderer and a villain, a slave that is not a twentieth part of the tithe of your precedent lord, a I vice thought, of kings, a cut purse of the empire and the rule. I thought she was just yelling, Hamlet. <laughs> Right, and then the the ghost comes on and says, "This visitation is but to wet thy almost blunted purpose." You know this wonderful uh, metaphor of of the, of the dagger, or the, or the 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 blunted instrument, and telling him to sharpen it. Okay, and then here, this is mostly for plot. Uh, the letter to be taken to England has been defined and sealed, and he is going off to England with Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Uh, where, where is it? Uh, the, his two schoolfellows, whom I will trust as I will adders fanged, they bear the mandate, but must sweep my way and marshal me to neighbor. Let it work. For tis the sport to have the engineer hoist with his own petard, and shall go hard, but I will delve one yard below their minds and blow them at the moon. All right, so they've got this letter that's basically the death warrant for Hamlet. And what, what happens with that? He replaces the letter. He puts another one telling them, uh, kill Rosencast and Guildenstern instantly as soon as you open the letter. And so the, this is that they are ho hoisted so their he, own petard. So uh, Hamlet ordered their death, right? Hamlet orders the death of Rosencast and Guildenstern, indeed, because originally it was his death that was mandated in the letter that was replaced. But he opened the letters and saw it. Yep. Yeah. Good night, mother. Okay, now we've got all of this uh, stuff with these these uh, Cockney grave diggers, as uh, as it's described. Did you get a chance to see Hamlet's small rewrite? No. Okay, that that's was... also in there. Okay. Take, take a look at that; you'll enjoy it. Okay, and so of course he comes upon the grave diggers after he's managed to escape with the help of pirates and uh, uh, and uh, so forth. Uh, he manages to make his way back and talk to Horatio, and he finds these uh, grave diggers. Oh, this is where I was going to start my recitation. Oh, okay. You you, you tell me where you'd like to start. Uh, is it here? Um, sure. This is Laertes. Yeah, I was just going to go from here to the end. I mean, not not the end, the end of the play, but the where you. Um, Oh, okay. where, where, um, after, after, right after Hamlet dies. Oh, okay. Is that too much? Um, no, no. Uh, uh, by all means, in fact, that's so close to the end. I, I've skipped all, uh, all of the uh, material leading up to the play and Osric and all of that lot. And now, uh, uh, up you, to the... you had skipped um, some stuff in, in between those. Also, right. right? Yeah. Uh, there's a lot skipped in here. I just mm -hmm. I just chose these rather uh, mm -hmm. capriciously, right. and so uh, I, I hope it uh, it manages to provide enough plot so we can figure out where things are. But suddenly uh, we're at the uh, um, at the fencing match. Yeah. The duel. Um, uh, go ahead, choose choose a part, or you can do yeah. both. Which of you? Um, do you guys? 
do you, do you want to? I, I was just gonna do all of them, but go go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Do you guys want to do something, or do you care? I I, I don't see an okay. enormous amount of enthusiasm <laughs> on this side. Okay. Oh villainy! Ho! Oh, let the door be locked. Treachery! Seek it out. It is here, Hamlet. Hamlet, thou art slain. No medicine in the world can do thee good. In thee there is not half an hour of life. The treacherous instrument is in my hand. Unabated and envenomed, the foul practice hath turned itself on me. Lo, here I lie, never to rise again. My mother's poisoned, I can no more. The king, the king's to blame. The point in venom too, then venom to thy work. Ah. Treason, treason! <laughs> oh, yet defend me, friends, I am but hurt. Here, thou incentuous, murderous, damned Dane, drink off this potion. Is thy union here? Follow my mother. He is justly served. It is a poison tempered by himself. Exchange forgiveness with me, noble Hamlet. Mine and my father's death come not upon thee, nor thine on me. Heaven make free, make thee free of it. I follow thee. I am dead, Horatio. Wretched queen, adieu. You, you look that pale and tremble at this chance, that there are but mutes or audience to this act. Had I but time, as this is, fell sergeant death and stri is strict in his arrest, oh, I could tell you, but let it be. Horatio, I am dead. Thou livest. Report me in my cause a right to the unsatisfied. Oh, I die, Horatio. The potent poison quite o'ercrows my spirit. I cannot live to hear the news from England, but I do prophesy the election lights on Fortinbras. He has my dying voice. So tell him with the occurrence, more or less, which I have solicited, solicited. The rest is silence. Silence. Oh, cracks a noble heart. Good night, sweet prince. And flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. Very nicely done. Yeah. There. There are so many little words in there. One of the trickiest parts of doing an accent is trying to get all of the words equal, which I find I stumble over all the time because I'm not decided exactly which. Uh, which way I'm going to do it? Yeah. But, uh, you you want to try to get all of the uh, all of the open A's uh, open, and you only miss one, as far as I can tell. Right. And most most of it uh, very nicely done. Any questions at all? We we've finished up Hamlet, and I I don't see a, a, a nervous amount of enthusiasm. <laughs> um, I think it was wonderful. Mm -hmm. It, it's uh, it's an amazing place, isn't it? It's, mm -hmm. it's so so remarkable. Never had any experience with it before. You, you haven't. No. Uh, it's we, we really should uh, find some things and read them together. I think. Yeah. There's uh, a you... kind of humorous, very short synopsis of Hamlet in Tom Sawyer the musical. Oh, that's right. Where, there is. Where isn't Tom there? is uh, he's telling Huck about. Um, about it. It's, of course, it's completely off, yeah. but it's funny and it's it's. He right, just it's, gets it's, a little of the. He sticks poison down his ear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a, a lot of reference to uh, to literature in uh, actually more in Huck, Huckleberry Finn mm. than in Tom Sawyer yeah. at the at the end there. Uh, yeah. But Tom Tom Sawyer has a lot of Robin Hood in it. Mm -hmm. Because that that's their favorite game to play, and that's his favorite book, and all that. So. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay, let's uh, let's decide what you would like to do more of for next time. We still have this poem here, if anybody's interested. Any interest in a pirate poet poem? No. No. Okay. <laughs> it's it's this is just a marvelous thing. I. I Recommend it, but you can easily read it on your own. Okay, let's find our agenda. There we are. Okay, so for this time, um, 
uh, Bach was requested. Now, I have to apologize in a way because so much of Bach is probably not of that much interest because most of it's liturgical. He really only spent three years uh, working in a secular environment during which he wrote an immense amount in the way of concerti and the uh, well-tempered clavier and uh, inventions and all of those uh, wonderful uh, material yeah. uh, in a relatively short period of time. Uh, and of course that's what I chose from for this. Uh, when we have all of the chorales, vast quantity of uh, chorales and uh, and or uh, Cantatas. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, if you like these, uh, does anybody have any other requests specifically? Re understanding, of course, that whatever we speak about in the class here is on subject because speaking is what this class is about. Mm -hmm. So I'm happy to launch into other areas, including, for example, classical music, which is one of my favorites. Or we can discuss some other topic, particularly if one of you would like to uh, come in and expound upon it. Um, I would really enjoy if we talked about Tolkien. Um, wonderful. Uh, what would you like to do with Tolkien? I don't know. <laughs> um, not just focusing on the Lord of the Rings or the Hobbit, something more general than that. Okay. Whether it's about, you know, where um, his ideas came from or the, um, uh, um, if there are actually notable differences or inconsistencies between the Lord of the Rings and the Silmarillion and things like that. There are a few. I don't, I'm not a great expert on, on that. I mean, I've read it, and I've met experts, which has brought it home to me very clear that I'm not an expert. Um, but uh, I invite you to do some research on your own. There are some wonderful sites online. The people who are uh, truly enthusiastic and have researched deeply into these and know every word that exists in Elvish, all uh, all flavors, all dialects of Elvish, um, have put much of this material online. At one point, the best resource I thought there was uh, a guide to Middle Earth by Foster, I think his name was, which was simply a concordance. I'm sure you've come across biblical and uh, Shakespearean concordances, but that was a Shakespearean concordance. But that's not really necessary anymore because so much of that material. Um, that was wonderful uh, to have a concordance to find these things. Mm -hmm. It's not necessary anymore. You just you Google it and you find it. But uh, have you ever used a biblical concordance or a Shakespearean mm -hmm. concordance? Uh, before the days of Google, if you wanted to know where in Shakespeare or where in the Bible a particular word or phrase existed, you go to a concordance and look it up and it will tell you exactly where everything was. Uh, this couldn't feasibly be done with every book in the world, but with uh, the Bible and Shakespeare it was done. Uh, and that's what this work served, uh, that's the purpose this work served as far as Tolkien was concerned. But now, of course, there are so many other sites, and I'm afraid I'm not even an expert on what they all are. Would you like to find some for us? Um, no. <laughs> Um, I'm not actually sure where I would look, and I'm not sure which sources I could trust as being good. Good point. Um, I am not, I'm actually very bad at that kind of research. Maybe it's something we've got to practice a little bit. Um, let's do some together then, or at least I'll do some and I'll, I'll, I'll send you some material on it. I think probably the, uh, one of the best places to start is Wikipedia. Because although uh, Wikipedia is a mixed bag and is written by all kinds of different people, the people who are likely to post and contribute material to Wikipedia are likely to be the ones who are fanatically fascinated with the material. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of those. 
Mm -hmm. And so we will look at the differences between Noldoran and Sindarin and uh, the contradictions, uh, and indeed there are some contradictions between the Lord of the Rings and the Silmarillion, specifically references to uh, Gondolin. Uh, he, he changed his thoughts about the fall of Gondolin, if mm -hmm. I recall correctly. There's actually a website on like kind of verifying the I mean, not verifying Wikipedia, but like that it makes it good to see. Um, it's it's a real time maybe flash program or something. And it's a web it's a website, but it shows you what pages are being edited in real time mm -hmm. of being updated. Mm -hmm. And it also shows um, like how big the change is. Mm -hmm. So it'll show like how many words. That's stuff. a nice idea. So because it was, it was um, most cool. of the time I find the And then it's, they're popping up like every second. No, that, that will be interesting. Could you post it for us? I, I don't, I, I, I think Nicholas showed it to me or something. I'll, I'll try and find it, yeah. Okay, well, in, invite Nicholas to join vicariously. Right. <laughs> is what he's doing. No, that, that would be very interesting to see. Most of the time I find that uh, content of Wikipedia is very useful, but the problem is you can't cite it. Yeah. It, you, 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 can't, it's, you can't cite something that's going to change by the time somebody else looks at it. Yeah. But it uh, usually has good reference to other material, and that other material can be cited or very often can be cited. So let, let's take a look at that and see what we can find. There are a lot of really wonderful sources out there. If I find some good sources, I'm going to throw them in your direction and let you look at them, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, let's, let's look further into Tolkien. Indeed, there's so much to see there, but it's important also to realize that it's often its own rather peculiar uh, hermetic and uh, uh, fantastic world that doesn't necessarily interface with, with the rest of literature that much. Wonderful. Okay. Um, also, something worth looking at, perhaps, is uh, Tolkien-inspired poetry, which we've looked at here a little bit today, and Tolkien-inspired music, of which there is a fair amount. So uh, the soundtracks of uh, Lord of the Rings and well, the, uh, the soundtracks of Lord of the Rings. Yes, they certainly uh, qualify. But aren't necessarily as uh, as thorough as uh, as has been provided by some of the others, and some of it's available and some of it isn't, and some of it's brilliant stuff has just vanished, which is also one of the problems with Wikipedia. I found articles up there absolutely wonderful. Next time you look, it's gone. <laughs> Put something else up instead. Anyway, let's go ahead and do that, and then we're going to, I believe all of us, go on to uh, working with, uh, with music. Mm -hmm. And so uh, let's bring things here to an end and see if... Uh, okay. Uh, and uh, I'm glad you uh, could join us, Diana, but uh, we've got to figure out how the acoustics work a little bit more effectively, how your microphonics can be made to be audible at our end, which I'm afraid was not successful this time. And uh, you might want to put the volume back up. Uh, yeah, you can do that. But, uh, okay. So. Uh, Till next time, we'll, we'll uh, do a little bit of Tolkien. Another question, of course, I have to ask is, uh, anybody interested in another Shakespeare? Midsummer Night's Dream? Midsummer Night's Dream? <laughs> um, I, I, them. I would well, be yeah. at least slightly yeah. interested. Slightly yeah. interested. Yeah. What, what, what are your thoughts, yeah. Jack? Um, I'm fine with anything, again, because it's always good. Okay, Midsummer Night's Dream is fascinating and wonderful. Uh, Romeo and Juliet is, is is a marvelous thing too. Our the favorites that we've we've done most uh, on a number of occasions are uh, uh, Twelfth Night and As You Like It. Uh, we probably did that when you were in class before, Jack. Yeah. Taming of the Shrew is also pretty entertaining. Taming of the Shrew is definitely entertaining, albeit somewhat. Uh, um, uh, what, what's the word? 
politically incorrect. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, yes, we could we could certainly look in that direction. Uh, there there are some other uh, wonderful things as well. Um, is uh, Midsummer Night's Dream the uh, preference for everybody? I, w I would like to go into the naming of the shoe. Okay. okay. Um, I actually don't have much interest in Midsummer Night's Dream, so. Taming of yeah. the is okay. I actually know next to nothing about that one. So, so I can guess by the name what it's about. Okay, well, it's it's an interesting one. It's uh, it's, it's a bit demeaning, is it? Yeah. <laughs> it is. And I have a little uh, a discomfort level with uh, with the overall uh, concept of. Uh, Indoctrination and subjugation that uh, that runs through it, but uh, we don't have to do it. I mean, well, I mean, th th this is the question: whether that that would be appropriate, and uh, whether our uh, 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 female members not present might have raised an objection. Oh, that's a good point. I'm sorry. I said that is a good point. <laughs> um. Let's see. I, I'm, I'm just. I just don't really want to jump into it. If uh, is one of the others. You, you're not interested in Midsummer Night's Dream. Jack, do you have any uh, specific thoughts? Um, I'm fine with anything, but if you want, we could just wait and ask if more yeah. people attend. Okay. Yeah. yeah that that makes sense. But yeah. if you want to like plan up all that, one by. Um, Sure. How about um? I mean, is Rosencrantz and Guildenstern? I'll tell you what. Why don't Why don't we plan to look at Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead for next time? Right. Yeah. Yeah. That That is the like. Okay. That That's That sounds like something. Um, Just like because that's shorter, shorter, right? Um. It's It is shorter, and uh. It's well. It's almost everything is shorter in Hamlet, yes. um, but uh, it has some really wonderful pithy things in it, and I'll just collect those up and let you let you watch the whole thing. The whole thing is on video, and I believe it's uh, findable. And we've got the the full text linked in the uh, in the classroom. So let let's go ahead and do that, and then we'll uh, choose some excerpts. You choose some excerpts too. I will choose my favorites, and we'll bring them all in. Okay. So we will do that for next time. Any anything in the uh, classical music realm that you would like to uh, like to have added? Um, I don't know much about Chopin. Chopin. Okay. Um, interesting point. I, I I omitted him. I omitted an awful lot of things here. I uh, we have Beethoven and Schubert and uh, what did I put in after Schubert? Uh, I'm not even sure I put in any of the great opera composers oh. of the 19th century. One of my favorites is Peter and the Wolf. Uh, Prokofiev. Mm. Um, okay, that's certainly an interesting introduction to the musical instruments anyway. Uh, there are some very nice productions of that, and I'll see if I can find one. One of my favorites, I think, is uh, Peter Ustinov. Now, Ustinov, I would put up there right next to... Uh, Fry and Hitchens and really? Miller and uh, his language is absolutely superb, but there isn't that much of it out there. I have his book, uh, his uh, autobiography, which is called Dear Me, <laughs> and it's just superbly written. But English, though he was a master of English, he also spoke equally well French and German and a number of other languages, and uh, just just a wonderfully well-rounded and uh, very uh, articulate person. Yeah. He did one version of uh, uh, Peter and the Wolf. Let's see if we can look at that, if I can find it, if it exists, and perhaps some of uh, other of his material, if we can find it. Right. Yeah, I, I, I don't know much about Prokofiev either, in general. Well, Prokofiev, well, I'll put it this way. I was a uh, contemporary Prokofiev for two years. In other words, he's a relatively modern composer. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, uh, he 
he launched out into a number of rather atonal areas at various times, yeah. but then he was also able to work within the t uh, tonal media very effectively. Uh, his classical symphony is wonderful. His Lieutenant Kija suite is one that I would recommend. Remind me if I forget to post these up there. I think you'll probably enjoy that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he, he did incidental music to Romeo and Juliet, which right. everybody knows the sound of, but they don't know where it came from. Yeah. <laughs> so so the, he did quite a lot of uh, a very interesting material there. Prokofiev, then. Let's, let's play with Prokofiev yeah. for next time. And uh, if you want to, do a little research on uh, uh, Chopin and, and see what you can bring up. Um, he's another utterly fascinating character mm. I didn't include in, in this little listing. What do you mean by atonal? Tell you what, uh, let's bring English class to an end here and start the music theory class and then we'll <laughs> jump into that. <laughs> okay. okay, see everybody next week.